And we're live. Welcome, everyone. I'm Mark Johnson, a volunteer with the Canadian Celiac Association, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Don Dirksen, Chair of the Professional Advisory Council of the CCA. Welcome, Don. Thanks, Mark. Happy to be here. So this is the first of our In Conversation series for you on matters relating to celiac disease and the gluten-free diet. Every other month, we're going to be bringing these to you as part of our CCA. CA Connects newsletter. We'll be talking to leaders and change makers in the gluten-free industry, uh, the research field, medical professionals, stakeholders, and more. We hope that you will listen and learn, and you're invited to share your thoughts on potential guests with us too. You can email us anytime at communications at celiac.ca with any ideas. I'm very pleased we were able to get Dr. Dirksen for our first installment of In Conversation. Dr. Dirksen is a medical doctor and uh, associate professor of medicine and section head of gastroenterology at the University of Manitoba. He also serves as site coordinator in gastroenterology at St. Boniface Ho uh, General Hospital. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Don is the uh, chair of the CCA's Professional Advisory Council, and he has extensively studied the positive celiac serology in postmenopausal women and its contribution to osteoporotic fractures and low bone density. I'm really looking forward to our discussion, so uh, let's get right into it. Uh, Dr. Dirksen, could you introduce us to the Professional Advisory Council? Tell us who is on it, maybe what the, what is their role with respect to the uh, CCA of, of the members and the PAC as a whole? Sure. So, Mark, this is a multidisciplinary group of, of professionals that have an interest and expertise in celiac disease. It's made up of physicians, dietitians, scientists um, uh, that, uh, that, that meet regularly uh, with, on, on telehealth. And, and there's really a Canadian uh, distribution, Canadian geographic, cross-Canada geographic that we're happy to have. Currently, uh, we have two pediatric gastroenterologists. We have just Dr. Justine Turner from Edmonton and Dr. Dominika Gidrowicz from Calgary. We've got two adult gastroenterologists, Dr. Uh, Inez Pinto Sanchez from McMaster in Hamilton and myself. Uh, we have a family physician, Dr. Kim Bender from the Peel region. We have a food scientist, uh, Dr. Iris Joy uh, from Guelph. And then we have four clinical di dietitians. Uh, as part of this group, uh, we have Shelley Case, who's well known uh, in uh, as a well-known expert in gluten-free diets. Uh, and she's now living in Calgary. Uh, Dana Wheaton is a dietitian from Winnipeg with pediatric experience. Uh, Inez Martin Sevek is a um, dietitian from Sick Kids in Toronto, who also has um, pediatric expertise. And then Dr. Adriana Smallwood, all the way out in Newfoundland, uh, makes up our board. So we have representation of different disciplines, and we have. Um, uh, 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 also geographic representation, which really makes for a, for a real great group. I think if you, know, if you were to say like, what do we do? Um, you know, there, if you were distilled our, our tasks, if you like, um, we review and develop a lot of education materials that are relevant to uh, celiac disease and we make sure they're evidence-based. We make sure they're based on current science. We, we advocate. So if you look back at the history of the PAC, uh, it was instrumental in, um, getting food labeling laws introduced in 2014. And we have ongoing advocate, uh, things we're advocating for now. We adjudicate the J. Campbell Awards, which are research awards uh, that are given out. Um, we initiate some research ourselves. And so the Canadian Celiac, uh, Canadian Celiac Survey is something that's been uh, uh, wildly published and quoted in the past. Uh, once again, we have some current things we're doing. Uh, we develop position papers. So we review the scientific data on certain issues and then lay out a position that people can, can uh, uh, look at and apply. And then finally, you know, there's always new things coming up in celiac disease. There's new, new research studies. And what we do is we take these studies and we try and put them in some clinical con context. In other words, what does this mean for the person with celiac disease? So those are a few of the things that we're involved with. And uh, once again, we've got a great group that, uh, that we work with. Yeah, I say diversity is strength. I mean, you've got, sounds like we have all the bases covered um, between all the members of the PAC. Uh, so that's interesting. And could you I mean, talk a bit more about like um, the, the survey that you mentioned? What was involved there? Yeah, I think the, the initial survey, uh, which was done, was the survey really of all the uh, CCA members. Uh, and it was a very in-depth survey that, that covered many pages. And again, a, a big kudo to uh, members of the CCA who took the time to fill this out. And it allowed us to look at issues like, for instance, how long does it take to get diagnosed? 
Um, and it, it allows to get some Canadian data on that. It allowed us to look at the type of symptoms that people uh, present with. Um, and there's lots of information that we could glean from something like that. Um, and so that was something that was very successful. And, and currently, more recently, we've done some surveys on um, uh, the may contain statements and how people interpret may contain gluten statements, which has been very helpful in understanding where people are coming from. And also, and when people introduce oats into their diet, these are controversial issues. And we've done some surveys looking at people's practices, and then that will help us develop guidelines going forward. Interesting. So, so in terms of some of the most recent work, uh, what have you guys been involved in? Yeah, it, it's been the oats and the may contain statements have been mm -hmm. have been two of the things um, we're looking at. Sort of, you know, issues that um, again that have sort of come up recently. There's been an issue on. You know, when's the optimal time to introduce gluten to, to an infant of someone that may have celiac disease? And I, these sound like simple questions, and they are. Uh, having said that, when you look at the science, there's, there's layers, and there are studies that contribute to the, um, to, to the knowledge about this, but they don't necessarily tell you exactly what should be done. And so we're, we're, we're sort of putting all that data into, into some recommendations. Um, we look at practical things like there, there are new gluten detectors that are out, you know, what's the value of those? There's how much gluten is in medications has been an issue that we've been looking at. Um, and cross-contamination of various things. There's some studies that show that maybe cross-contamination isn't as common as we once thought. And we're looking at, at um, uh, evaluating that, that literature. Well, thank you. Uh, every one of those topics sounds highly relevant for uh, the vast majority of us in the, uh, the gluten-free communities, so that's uh, appreciated. I also understand the CCA is now accepting applications for research funding. Can you walk me through like how that works, when the deadline is, what sure. kinds of research yeah. we fund? Yeah, I, yeah. And in fact, I start by saying that um, this is a really important part of uh, the CCA, um, and people may not realize it, but for those of us that, and I've been a beneficiary of this, so I can speak from personal experience. Um, there aren't any other uh, celiac only research uh, grants available in Canada. This is it. Um, and it's helped many uh, investigators uh, start their career and also gives them um, initial funding to start uh, research in different topics. We really have two awards. We've got a Young Investigator Award and then we have a main award. The Young Investigator Award is very helpful for students, uh, grad students, uh, medical students, medical residents. Uh, and again, many people on the CCA uh, PAC have been recipients of these awards and they've, they've helped uh, start careers. A whole spectrum of research is supported. So this could be basic science, lab work. This could be epidemiologic, epidemiologic research. So, you know, population based or it could be clinical based. In other words, looking at different clinical populations. It's, it's really broadly based. Um, our deadline is... Uh, uh, mid-February and what happens is there's a, online you can find the application form and the criteria uh, you can send them into the office as a PAC we'll review these uh, these are competitive grants we'll review them usually in April uh, we score them and then we will award the successful applicants once the adjudication has been performed and it's a task we take very seriously and as I say it's been um, it's been a real stimulus to see that research in Canada during our last two webinars, uh, both in May and in November, we had JC Young Investigators present their research, and both of these individuals have published their, their research findings in uh, very well-renowned um, uh, papers, uh, scientific papers, journals. So uh, it's been a very successful uh, uh, fund. Yes, I, uh, I was uh, fortunate to uh, be uh, emceeing those conferences, and I uh, know... Uh, if we, if anyone missed out on hearing about the Young Investigator Award uh, presentations uh, from uh, last year's conferences, uh, those are on the CCA's YouTube channel. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, learn more about the research projects that have been funded by the CCA historically, if you go to, to uh, celiac.ca, our website, um, under the heading Healthcare Professionals, you'll see research awards and uh, lots there to read about, including the current open application process. So that's, uh, that's exciting. I look forward to seeing what, uh, what comes in. Yeah. So uh, now, Dr. Dirksen, I'm going to kind of bring up the, the elephant in the room. Um, I know everyone's looking for clarification on celiac disease and COVID-19. Uh, could you uh, first, uh, let's start at the beginning, um, uh, the, the questions that came out initially. Are you at higher risk of catching COVID-19 or at risk of more serious side effects from COVID-19 um, as a celiac than an average person? 
Right. So now we're coming up to, you know, 10 months of having had COVID in Canada, and uh, we are a bit wiser than we were before. And, and I think but we haven't changed our message. So the message still appears to be that you're not at increased risk of getting COVID if you have celiac disease, number one. Number two, not at increased risk of having severe disease if you do get it. Um, and so it behooves everybody to use the same PPE principles that we would all um, uh, adhere to and, and, and hand washing, et cetera, distancing uh, um, uh, methods that, that everybody is, is promoting. Um, but we don't have to uh, be concerned that people with celiac have a higher risk. Um, and this, by the way, is similar. It's not only celiac, there's other autoimmune diseases that I deal with like Crohn's disease and, and ulcerative colitis. And, and we would say similar things about those conditions that people aren't at increased risk of either getting it or getting a more severe course. So I know there's uh, heavily, uh, like a celiac disease is heavily associated with other autoimmune diseases, like you mentioned, a couple of thyroid disease and type one diabetes. So as far as we're concerned, like someone with celiac disease or someone with celiac and other autoimmune conditions, essentially, Actually, unless they're immunocompromised for some other reason, the uh, the risk is generally the same as the exactly. Population. I would say in general, you're absolutely right. There, there, in people that have very exceptional other conditions, you know, it's something to, to look at for sure. But in general, even if you have some other autoimmune conditions, it, 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 it shouldn't be an increased risk. And by the way, there is a, a database, a worldwide database uh, that is on the internet, um, trying to uh, uh, collect information on patients with celiac disease who develop um, uh, COVID. Um, the uh, website is covidceliac.org. Uh, and if you have celiac disease and get COVID, you could even go on there yourself and enter your data and be part of counting as part of, uh, of the information we gather. And so far of the 100 plus people that have been entered into this database, again, we don't get any sense that there is a, an adverse outcome associated with, with, with uh, you know, people at similar risk as, as, as other people would be. That's a relief for, for everyone. Uh, still definitely don't want to let our guard down. And uh, I, uh, I think it's great that they're they're collecting data at the, you said covidceliac.org, um, I think it was. So uh, yeah, if anyone out there has has had COVID-19, uh, um, our sympathies for having to go through that experience, uh, first of all, but uh, the CCA is a, is guided by science, a strong believer in science and having, having more information available uh, helps to uh, like that support scientific study uh, down the road. And there's going to be a lot of scientific study of COVID-19 after this is uh, all done and has started already. So uh, again, if you or anyone you know has celiac disease and experienced COVID-19, please uh, do register on that website. It's, it's, it's open worldwide, I believe. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. And I know the uh, the professional advisory council uh, came out with some some statements on uh, the vaccine questions. Uh, uh, can you tell us about like there's I know there's a couple of vaccines going around Canada. Where does the CCA stand in terms of uh, the safety for those with celiac disease? Sure, and and that's that's been the issue that's probably had most press in the past uh, month. Now that the vaccine is available, and what's made it even more uh, pressing is that. Some of the initial uh, criteria included not having an autoimmune disease, that, that people were, if they had an autoimmune disease, they weren't necessarily considered candidates. And that was really because autoimmune diseases weren't specifically tested uh, when they did their initial studies. Um, again, and I think provinces are different, um, but I would say from a professional point of view, so, um, and this would apply to, again, uh, Canadian Association of Gastroenterology has guidelines for Crohn's and colitis. We've looked at this from a celiac point of view, and although it hasn't been formally tested, we have no reason to believe from a scientific point of view that people with celiac disease would have, number one, an adverse outcome uh, related to vaccination, or number two, a less effective uh, vaccination uh, because of the underlying celiac disease. So we're, we're recommending that, that they get the vaccine, um, and I think provinces are developing their, uh, their uh, pathways in order to accommodate this. And I know in Manitoba, there's specific consent forms to sign, uh, but if, if medical professionals uh, are uh, recommending it, uh, then, so I, I think I would still recommend for people to talk to their, their physicians about this. Um, and again, this, there, there are some uh, allergic reactions related to this vaccine. That's a different story. That's a different problem. It's not a gluten related, uh, a problem, but if people have allergies to various things, in addition to celiac disease, that is something that is worth investigating. So I would say in general, if we, if we had a general statement, we'd say uh, 
people with zodiac disease should consider being vaccinated. They should check with their uh, physician to see if there's any uh, reasons why they shouldn't. Uh, and then, but in general, I would expect most of them to get vaccinated. Okay. Yeah, it was certainly a, a relief to uh, to learn that uh, there's no uh, no concerns uh, with regard to celiac disease and getting vaccinated. The celiac celiacs were were known for having other food sensitivities too. So, but often like not so much allergies. So, like if someone is uh, celiac and they're lactose intolerant, they they react ne negatively to perhaps eggs or corn. I know eggs are like those kind of things do. I get found in a lot of vaccines, but um, if it's a sensitivity only and not like it's only if it's an allergy that there's a concern. Is that what you're exactly. saying? Exactly. Yep. And there's some specific allergies that um, there's some rare allergies that people may have a trouble trouble with, but but um, most of them would not be an issue at all. And certainly, things like lactose intolerance would not be an issue at all. Mm -hmm. Thanks for looking at this on our behalf. Uh, it's obviously very timely, very needed, and very appreciated. And I, I know you guys will continue to to monitor the vaccine rollout. Uh, the, the CCA, just to turn to another issue, over the past year, the CCA has hosted um, a like, number of events on, uh, on uh, celiac disease relating to COVID-19. We have, of course, switched to online conferences for 2020 to, uh, to be able to, to reach everyone from their homes, looked at like, shopping tips, mental health resources, food security as well. How would you say, uh, just to, to look at your uh, situation, uh, Dr. Dirksen, how has uh, COVID impacted uh, your clinic in Winnipeg? Uh, like what is, and so yeah, how, how has it changed uh, the way you do business? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest change is probably reflect uh, across Canada is that we do a lot more of our uh, uh, consultations and follow-ups virtually. So they're done online or via telephone call and um, just to avoid that personal interaction. And, and I think there are pros and cons to that method. The, the, the pros are that, that um, it, there's a convenient factor which some people actually like, um, and we can get a lot of information that way and we can still deal with a lot of issues. The, the cons are that, that there are some times where a physical exam is, is very relevant and we don't have the opportunity to do that as much. Um, although again, virtually there are some things that you can do to get around that. Um, and I think there's a personal element that might make it a bit more difficult uh, to connect. Uh, but, but I think by and large, it's been quite successful in, in carrying on with medical care virtually has been the biggest change that we've had. When we initially, you know, when COVID initially started, we were also very concerned, obviously, with the whole transmission aspect of it. And, and, and we're concerned about our resources being able to handle um, increased COVID cases. And, and I know from a gastrointestinal point of view, we actually stopped doing elective uh, cases. And from a celiac point of view, that meant elective gastroscopies. So, and, and, and I know here in Manitoba, if people needed a scope, let's say for celiac diagnosis, we would say, you know what, we, don't, we can't prioritize that high enough at this stage, uh, given the COVID concerns. And, and, and that, that, that was a potential problem. Um, as time has gone on, we've realized our, our units have become um, uh, changed in terms of how we do our cases, how we prepare patients, how we protect ourselves with PPE. Um, and so we're back up to functioning much closer to normal. Uh, and we're not limiting our cases with respect to diagnostic cases. We are doing those cases. Um, and so things are back much, much closer to normal now with respect to endoscopic uh, procedures. Uh, but we're still doing a lot of our, um, off, our, our clinical work uh, virtually when it comes to office visits. I imagine the procedures vary a little bit by province as well. Uh, you're, you're there will be some of change. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and again, the other thing that may change with that is, is you know, there are, are hotspots in Canada at various times where, um, you know, when there's a hotspot, you may, again, you may have to divert your resources, whether that is endoscopic resources, even nursing resources, away from the endoscopy units to help in other places. And I know our endoscopy nurses were prepared to have to work possibly on COVID wards. That never happened because we didn't reach that point, but other places that may be an issue. Um, and so it's still, you know, we haven't solved COVID obviously, and, and, and there will still be ups and downs with respect to the numbers. And if numbers do increase, then that may change uh, how much, for instance, elective uh, scopes are being done. Right. Yeah, I know a lot of us, we read the, the horror stories from early in the pandemic when yeah. cancer patients couldn't get treatment, that kind of thing. For, for the purposes of uh, celiac disease, what do you, what's your message to people who they might have had a positive blood test, they want to get the endoscopy, they know they're not 
supposed to go gluten free before getting the endoscopy, but they've been told they're going to have to wait at least a year or whatever for uh, to get their yeah. endoscopy, and they're suffering in the meantime. What what should they do? Yeah, it, 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 it's it's a tough scenario. Again, one of the principles that I I still believe very strongly in is that we really like to make the diagnosis definitively. It's so helpful to have a biopsy to say yes, you know, you have the symptoms, you have the um, serology that's positive and we have a biopsy that supports us. So now we know exactly what we're dealing with. So that is the goal in my mind is still to, to, to achieve that. I think, and, and, and I think that each case, by the way, needs to be discussed on its own merit. I think there are, there are, are nuances. And, and so it's worth discussing with the gastroenterologist in each case. I, I think if people are having uh, tough symptoms, then I think there may be a role for lessening gluten, but maybe not eliminating it completely. I think there's a role for advocating uh, for those people that are very symptomatic to really push to try and get this biopsy done sooner. And there are frequently ways, ways to do that. Um, I think in, if you look at extreme cases where people are very symptomatic um, and there really doesn't look like there's going to be a biopsy happening for a long time, you know, then I think you can look at the pros and cons of, of eliminating as much gluten as you can, possibly challenging in the future. Um, but I think that discussion should take place um, again, with, with, the, with the qualified specialist. When it comes to pediatrics, uh, it's a little bit of a different paradigm. Uh, there are criteria in pediatrics where uh, uh, diagnosis is possible without biopsy. Um, and so again, I think it, it, it's crucial to discuss this with a pediatric gastroenterologist to look at those criteria. And if people fell under that, if pediatric people fell under that, you know, you're an adolescent and it's really, you're having tough symptoms, it'd be worth seeing whether that was, was a possibility. And that would be limited to children and adolescents? Uh, correct. In terms of the protocol? Anybody under 18. Yeah, that's right. So for adults then, if um, like say someone was suffering immensely uh, and uh, had to go gluten-free and didn't wait for the endoscopy because they didn't know when it was going to happen. In terms of the, you mentioned the gluten challenge. I know the science has kind of evolved over the years. What's the latest in terms of like, how long do you need to go back on eating gluten before getting the endoscopy and how much? Yeah, this, this is one of those uh, uh, many areas in, in celiac disease where um, we don't have uh, definitive um, uh, studies that will say, you know, this is exactly what we should do. I think there's guidance that probably four to six weeks is what's needed. So unfortunately, it's more than just a month or, two, or a week or two, but probably four to six weeks. Um, and usually it's in the range of um, a slice or two of bread a day um, is what you would like uh, to to uh, add. So that, that would be the uh, the average. Now, in some people, Again, we can do things sooner because if we find that their blood tests are up, uh, then we might be able to, and we, we, if after two weeks we do a blood test and their, their antibodies are positive, that may be good enough uh, for us to biopsy at that point. So there are some ways sometimes where this becomes shorter. And I'm, it's my hope, we, well, unfortunately we don't have this now, but there are other methods that people are looking at. Um, uh, there's a really short challenge in looking at production of, of certain cytokines, uh, certain proteins in the blood that, that could be helpful. And there's also looking at lymphocytes in the blood, um, as back to a very short challenge, uh, that could also be helpful. Those are, well, that, that's where research is going right now. Like you said, uh, very case by case. Um, if yeah. people are, are waiting um, months for an endoscopy, if, uh, like if they're able to keep eating something, gluten to uh in order for the test to be uh, accurate that's uh that's great um but if the the suffering makes that impossible it's certainly understandable um but uh like i, I guess there's a, probably a word for caution for anyone who is thinking well maybe i'll just go gluten free and then do the challenge before because uh right. i've uh, heard for, uh, from people uh, anecdotally that have have tried that and then when they went on the gluten challenge it was just doubly punishing exactly. because you've you yep. gotten used to it so it's a pitfall I, i'd absolutely agree with that mark that would that'd be my experience as well in, in looking after folks that that frequently happens that people become more sensitive and that the challenge can be tough
Yeah. Yeah, challenge maybe yeah maybe challenge is a bit of an understatement uh, we should find <laughs> <Yeah>. another word uh, <laughs> and i won't i won't say torture session but it's definitely not pleasant for most people yeah. uh, so in terms of we talked about getting diagnosed uh, for those who have been diagnosed one of the most frequent questions we get you know i, I have celiac disease now what my doctor just kind of sent me on my way or the gastroenterologist maybe referred me to the cca but very little in terms of guidance how do i manage my my health and nutrition mm -hmm. i know the, the uh, professional advisory council has been working on developing Canadian specific clinical practice guidelines, but uh, many people, yeah, you know, many people aren't aware of what the next steps are after a diagnosis, sometimes even the medical professionals. So can you tell me more about that? Sure. I mean, you know, the, obviously the, the most important treatment is a gluten-free diet. And I think we start with, that's where education has to start. And so we would recommend um, uh, that people be see or get referred to a clinical dietitian that has some expertise in celiac disease. And that's really twofold. One is, to learn about what's gluten-free. And a lot of that learning can happen on the internet and with other resources. CCA has some great resources on that front. The other thing that the dietitian is helpful for is not only do we want people to be on a gluten-free diet, we want this to be a healthy diet. So we want to make sure that people um, are consuming things like adequate fiber, um, which sometimes is something that's missing, that they're not replacing a lot of uh, things they've previously ate with, with let's say high fat or high uh, simple carbohydrate foods. Um, so I think uh, seeing a dietitian and, and being educated with respect to a healthy gluten-free diet is probably the initial um, uh, step that I would recommend. Uh, once people have been diagnosed, you know, we do recommend regular follow-up and we recommend follow-up either with um, a primary care physician or a family physician or a uh, specialist, a, a gastrointestinal specialist. And we have uh, developed follow-up guidelines uh, for uh, uh, practitioners that include things like blood work, symptom review, you know, diet review in conjunction with a, a clinical dietitian, follow up with respect to bone mineral density and bone health, looking for other autoimmune diseases, um, and discussing with with uh, individuals need for things like supplements and complications. So we do think that follow up is important. Once people are well established uh, in terms of you know the gluten free diet part. We, we, we tend to recommend annual follow-up. And there is, there's information on the celiac.ca website uh, that you there can is. give to your doctor? Yeah. Okay, Correct. yeah, it's always uh, great to, uh, as much as the more medical professionals that we can get this information into their hands, uh, the better we all are, right? So I know uh, doctors probably studied celiac disease, but it might've been many years ago. Maybe they haven't seen yeah. a celiac patient lately and they might not be privy to the latest yeah. research. So that's another reason why the, uh, the PAC is such a valuable resource for us. Another uh, common question we get is, what should people do if they get glutened? If they've eaten gluten by accident and they're, they're yeah. feeling horrible? I've, I've seen mixed things online, like drink a lot of tea, take activated charcoal, I'm not sure about that. Can you speak a little bit about what people should do in this case? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, once people have ingested this, and in some ways the horse is out of the barn, in other words, there isn't that much you can do to, to try. You know, I think the hope would be, could we do anything that would... Um, uh, lessen the reaction and and let's say get rid of the gluten that's in the gut. Unfortunately, that's being broken down by, but it's, it's in, once it's in the small intestine, there's not much we can do to lessen its effect. So it's going to have it, it's going to take its course. And we've done some studies on gluten reactions and they do occur pretty quickly in a lot of people. And so, you know, a lot of people, it's within four to six hours, they will get these reactions. Most of the time they last less than 12 hours, but they can last for a longer period of time. But then it becomes a symptom control thing. So if it's, you know, if it's things like nausea, then, you know, it's taking anti-nauseants, uh, taking clear fluids, if it's diarrhea, then we look at anti-diarrheals. Uh, the, the reactions do vary quite a bit, but it's really symptomatic management. And I wish I could say there was an antidote. Uh, we don't have that at this point. Uh, that may happen. Uh, there may be medications being developed that uh, can break down gluten. But at this point, uh, we really don't have anything that would um, detoxify uh, any of the gluten that, that the individual is already exposed to. And I'd caution people, don't waste your money on those gluten cutters and things you see right. at the, the pharmacy. They're not meant for celiac disease at all. <laughs> Correct. Correct. 
So what, on celiac disease, uh, in terms of uh, the research, uh, there's it used to be thought, or it is often thought, that the, it impacts northern climate populations a lot more, northern Europe, Canada, U.S., etc. Uh, but there's more research, I understand, pointing to it as a worldwide phenomenon and growing. I know one group that might not have been as studied as much is Indigenous peoples. Can you uh, tell us, is the CCA engaged in any work on, on that area? Yeah, that, it's, it's an area of, of interest uh, to the CCA. Um, I think there's, there's, there's sort of two avenues. Number one, in fact, with our new J.A. Campbell, uh, our, our new competition, uh, the call has gone out to say, look, we're, we're, we're interested in, in uh, potential um, uh, uh, information on indigenous populations. So research in those areas is one, is one that we'll support. And secondly, the... Um, the PAC is looking at, 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 a, at a questionnaire that we're giving to uh, healthcare centers in Northern Canada, just to see their experience in terms of how often are they seeing celiac disease? Do they have the blood tests available to actually look for celiac disease? And what's their experience in managing individual celiac disease? So we really have very little knowledge on things like how common it is um, and is it less common or more common? Um, and then if, and then what are the challenges in a Northern climate uh, or in, in Northern uh, Canada uh, with respect to even food security? And of course, again, the CCA is uh, currently accepting applications for research funding. So uh, hopefully this is an area that will will be studied more in the future. Uh, we're almost out of time, uh, Dr. Dirksen. Uh, I just, I want to get one last question is because the, the yeah. CCA is turning 50 next year and a lot has changed over uh, its, uh, the 50 years of the CCA. Can you tell us uh, what you think have been some of the, some of the major milestones over the years for the CCA that we have helped advance or discovering, uh, discovered either relating to diagnosis or management of the disease? Sure. I mean, I, mean, I think when, when it comes to diagnosis, I think the development of the TTG antibody, which was in early 2000s, is, has been pivotal. Because uh, it's allowed us to realize how common CDAC is in different populations that we just talked about. It's allowed us, and once we are able to do that, then we can study these large populations and learn more about them. So, and, and then we, we've learned how that it is a very sensitive test. In other words, you can pick up, you can, if you're negative for TTG, it's very unlikely that you have CDAC disease. So, it, that diagnostic test, and because of the blood test so accessible, I think it's been. Um, that, that's been really important. The, the second thing with respect to celiac that I think has been uh, pivotal in the last couple of decades has been the research on, on, the, on the science of what happens when you ingest a little bit of gluten, um, what happens in your intestine and then what happens with your immune cells and what happens with the lining. And there are many steps in that process that, that people have broken it down to individual cells, the, the types of proteins they produce, and that whole pathway of pathogenesis or how this starts has led to people to, to, to points where you could potentially intervene. And now there are possible therapies, non-diet therapies that people are looking at, at at least five or six of these areas that are being going to be studied the next, you know, three, four or five years. And these are medications that have already been developed. They already have undergone phase one, in many cases, phase two trials. And now they're up for phase three trials where we're looking at, okay, there's some science that they work. Uh, there's some science they're safe. What is the science that they're actually better for people and what's their potential role? So it's, it's leading to sort of a new frontier um, and that's where we're going. I think the CCA in particular needs to be very, should congratulate themselves for, you know, being pioneers in food labeling uh, and advocating in food labeling. I think that's made, if you look at um, for individuals with um, food act disease, it's, it's, it's huge to be able to look at a label and say, oh, I can be confident that if this thing was made in Canada, that I should be seeing, and it has gluten in it, 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 it should be on that label somewhere. Uh, so I think that's made things much easier uh, for individuals uh, and Canadians in particular. So I think those are a few of the, um, of the um, I, I think, of, of, of discoveries and milestones. Uh, there's, there, there's many more yet to, uh, to, to achieve. The work yeah, is not been done. Uh, absolutely. A lot to unpack there, and I'm sure we'll be uh, diving into some more of those subjects in, uh, in future episodes of our In Conversation series. The, the food labeling, especially uh, Canada, really did make a breakthrough there, you know, compared to other countries like the U.S. that were they were jealous of us. Wow, you've got these, you've got such strong 
strict regulations in place. And whenever someone says to me they're newly diagnosed, it's so hard to read labels. I say, oh, well, let me tell you about before 2012. You want to know about difficult re difficulty reading labels, spending all day on the phone with companies trying to find out if there's gluten in their sauce. <laughs> That's right. so, um, yeah, yeah, definitely come a long way. So um, well, thanks very much. Did you have anything to add before we close it off? No, I, you know, the, the one thing that I would, I would simply, uh, I would thank all the individuals from the CCA um, uh, who have participated in studies, whether it's a, uh, a clinical trial or a, re or a, um, uh, a survey type of study. Um, people have been generous with their time. Uh, these surveys are immensely helpful. Uh, so if you ever have the opportunity, and there will be more in the future, um, again, I would uh, thank all of them for their, uh, for their the time and diligence they put into, into participating in these. Um, and I think the CCA for, again, having something like Jay Campbell Award that can stimulate research because that kind of gets the ball moving and is responsible for improving uh, various areas in terms of CIT's management. So thank you to all the members of the uh, CCA and also to the board of the CCA for all they do. Yeah, thanks everyone out there for who's ever participated in a, in a research study on celiac disease. The, the science is, is what we need and participants make it all happen. So uh, keep an eye on celiac.ca, uh, these or these conversations, as well as the CCA Connects newsletter, uh, the, the Canadian Celiac Association uh, uh, will uh, from time to time put out calls for, uh, for research participation that we've, uh, that we've received from partners. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, I'll definitely be watching for those. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time uh, today, Dr. Dirksen. Really appreciate uh, all that you do for us. My pleasure and nice to see your cat, Mark, mm -hmm. is uh, behaving nicely. Yes, uh, yeah, Killian and I say thank you. And thanks to everyone out there who, uh, who joined us today. So um, that's it for this, uh, this edition. But in March, we're going to be welcoming Dr. Elena Verdu, who will be speaking to us about gut health, microbiota, and celiac disease. Uh, Dr. Verdu, another past recipient of funding from the, uh, the Canadian Celiac Association's J. Alexander Campbell Research Fund. So uh, watch your CCA Connects newsletter and uh, celiac.ca for updates on that. Uh, you can definitely follow us on social media too. If uh, I drop the, the YouTube channel, also Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram uh, for all of our other news and events. Thanks everyone and goodbye for now.